email saying that we could maybe take up a collection if, if anyone's interested um, to donate to Karen's dad's uh, memorial fund. However, um, we asked her, and there's no like designated organization that he had um, wished that people give to. He wanted people to just kind of contribute to their whatever organization they felt um, compelled to give to. So this is my question to you guys. What kind of an organization would we maybe want to collectively give to in Karen's dad's honor? Can I throw out an alternative? Yes, please. Or. Or. <laughs> and. And. <laughs> exactly. um, maybe we take up a collection and get her a plant or a tree or something from the cohort that she can plant this spring. Oh, tree. That way we don't have to pick. That's a nice idea. Yeah. Just a suggestion. Okay. Benjamin tree. A what? We did a bench and a tree, one very close A bench and a tree? Mm -hmm. Wait, no. She was a very, very big gardener. Uh -huh. So we bought a dogwood tree and we bought a bench at Lowe's, I think. Yeah, was I don't remember how much it was. And just a little plaque from I the Sunday I mean, School bus. Yeah. Is there a certain tree yeah. that campus uses over in my There's several trees on campus that they've used to honor folks. I don't know. There before I got here, but I know it happened. I can do some check. It might be good to read some, so it's kind of confusing to listen to Yeah, it's going to be from Cohort 3 and the Andrews Institute, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, that's fine. Yeah, whatever this becomes. Okay, that's a great idea. I love that. I don't know, at, I get, at the bench, I don't know what kind of a yard oh. she has. Or a yeah. tree, too, but I guess. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I but actually, I love the idea. I think she is a gardener. She has a gardener? Yeah. I think she has pictures on Facebook of Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, um, however you want to give me cash, check, whatever. Okay. <laughs> I actually. Well, actually, um, it doesn't make more sense to find out the price of the thing and just split it amongst everybody. Like, who's going to come and participate? Just everybody can know. Yeah, just give what we can. And, and the Anderson Institute will cover those. Yeah, we'll cover the rest. Yeah, the Anderson Institute will cover the rest. Yeah. Okay. The Anderson okay. will cover the rest. Oh, okay. So, just give what you can. But, uh, Stacy, I've actually gotten you time to give another announcement. Okay. And that is on the girls? Um, the, the Music City Girls yes. League? Mm -hmm. um, just that we're still, applications are open through Monday at midnight, so if anybody still has a high school girl to nominate for this amazing program, mm -hmm. please do so. Um, we don't have all the spots quite filled up, and we like to get it maxed out because it's just awesome, and we want as many girls to experience this. And in particular, those of you who have networks like em, like uh, uh, Emily and your, I'm not saying this right, 100 Women for Change. Mm -hmm. No, who cares? 100 Women Who Care. And Kathleen's got her Hispanic Achievers, and where's Erin? Um, and Erin, Erin's got Black Achievers. So those of you who touch, and I'm not saying everybody, but those of you who touch young people in some way or have a network, please, please go to the website. Thank you for that time. All right. Um, Aaron, you get ready? Yeah. All right. And you are on the clock. <laughs> Is there a hand down on this one? Good afternoon, everyone. We are for three, and we had a book, The Tipping Point, um, by Malcolm Gladwell. And um, when I saw that the book was actually left on the list, I was kind of excited because I had uh, heard about the book for some time and I wanted to get to it um, because this book is recommended also for uh, folks in business and marketing, et cetera, um, when you're trying to find that sweet spot. And so I kind of came to my self-conclusion that maybe the majority of the classes are already read it. You know, Malcolm Gladwell is like one of those. He is a commercial uh, author. And so I know a lot of his work is known. So I was pretty excited to get it. This is Sylvia. This is my hobby. I'm going to go here. Um, in, this, in his book, The Tipping Point, Malcolm Gladwell develops on how ideas, products, messages, and behaviors essentially become epidemics. Uh, Gladwell states, the name given to that one dramatic moment in an epidemic when everything can change all at once is the tipping point. The tipping point is the biography of an idea, says Gladwell. Characteristics of epidemics are contagious, contagiousness, 
uh, little causes can have a big effect and the change happens not gradually but at one dramatic moment. In this book, uh, Gladwell attempts to answer the questions, why is that, why is it that some ideas, behaviors, or products start epidemics and others do not? And what can we do to deliberately start and control positive ep epidemics of our own? Um, and so here, we just give you a little feedback. Oh, I know how to work a Mac. This is Okay, perfect. Um, so let's go through this first. Did everyone have a book of matches? Yeah. yeah. Okay, if everyone takes their book of matches out, and I have just a little uh, brain teaser for you all. Yeah, there's about 20 matches in there, but I need everyone to kind of just, you know, start to rip your matches out at the, at the very bottom. Like, kind of separate them individually really quickly. It's going to take about 10 seconds to do that. Where's my book? Where's the matches? <laughs> All right, and so this is what I need you to do. Kind of clear the space in front of you, and if I can get everyone to use, you're going to use uh, two, four, six, eight, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fourteen. You're going to use fifteen matches. You're going to use your fifteen matches, and I need you to build this diagram uh, relatively quickly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the map, you, have, you have a blueprint in front of you. They're, they're, uh, so basically you're building um, one big square with four small squares in it, and you're building, I'm sorry, and you're building that one additional square on the outside. What, what did I hear back there? It's okay if you don't get the heads right. Okay. The, the direction of the red. Yeah, the portraits are the details. Yeah. 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 Okay, so at the bottom of the screen, you can't see it. Really just a nice little brain teaser. It, it tells you that there are five small and one large squares here. Mm -hmm. Take three matches away and leave three squares. Okay. One, uh, so you have five large, um, five, five small squares and one large square. Take away three matches and you should leave three squares. So you can determine which three matches you take away to leave three squares. I got it. Got it. Oh, that was good. That was good. That was good. Oh, that was good. Do we get candy? No. You got popcorn? Uh, okay. 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 Take away three and leave three squares. Take away three matches and leave three squares. Okay. You got it? Yeah. Okay, that's cool. So just just let that sit right there for a moment. We'll just, we'll just come back to it. Make sure that the brain is still active after all these snacks, which I enjoy. I took two of them. All right. Um, kind of get back here. Um, we go on to say, um, talking about the tipping point in the magic moment. It's the magic moment when an idea. Uh, trend or social behavior crosses the threshold, tip and spreads like wildfire. Just as, uh, just as a single stick, just as a single sick person can start an epidemic of the flu, so too can a small but pre precisely targeted push cause a fashion trend, uh, the popular popularity of a new product, or a drop in the crime rate. 
Um, and then we're just going to tell you a little bit about Glasswell here. Um, you mind taking Glasswell? I don't mind. Um, Malcolm Gladwell is the author of Five New York Times bestseller, <clears throat> The Tipping Point, Blink Outliers with a Dog Call, and now his latest, David and Goliath. He will be coming here in Nashville, as you all know, to talk about that book. Um, Underdogs, Misfits, and The Art of Battling Giants. He has been named one of the, one of the most, 100 most influential, oh, I can't say that, influential people by Time Magazine, and one of the foreign policy top global thinkers. Perfect. Um, so that's just a little bit about the author. One of the reasons that we chose to um, to do our presentation on Facebook is because we realized, uh, based on the read, that Facebook represented exactly what Gladwell talked about in his book. It represents an, an epidemic that took off like wildfire um, through social media. And Facebook, um, in so many ways, actually uh, helped us define what social media really was. And so um, Facebook actually just celebrated their 10th birthday uh, this past February. They were started in February of 2004. And, and they kind of, they did some of the work for us. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they actually, uh, they have the mile, a timeline which uh, highlights some of the major milestones. But although Facebook was started in, in 2004, one of their biggest milestones actually uh, occurred in 2006, um, where you see here where Facebook begins letting anyone over 13 join. It also introduces news feed, which collect friends, walls posts in one place. Although that led to complaints about privacy, news feed became one of Facebook's most popular features. And one of the reasons this, this served as a tipping point is because prior to 2006, you either had to have a, a college email address you had to have a college email address to uh, to join Facebook. Another one of their uh, major milestones happened in 2009. I don't know what took so long, but it's when they passed MySpace. Um, and they, they began to corner the market um, for social networks. And one of their more social um, trends, uh, their social um, tipping points is it happened in 2010 when uh, the social network the social network movie was released um, highlighting some of uh, Facebook's trials and errors the beginning middle and where they are now including the lawsuit oh, where they were better yet um, this right here is just a quick diagram um, one of the reasons like I told you that I was interested in the um, tipping point is because I had heard so much about the bell curve and a lot of us um, in our in our individual um, businesses we we have our own rendition of the bell curve and this one actually highlights one of the bell curves the bell curve or the tipping point of Mac um, and Mac actually just celebrated their 30th uh, birthday this month as well and it really shows how Mac um, found the sweet spot um, because we start off here with the Mac computers, um, <coughs> the box machines that range at anywhere from uh, 19, $1,900 to $2,900. And then we had our expensive iPods with the 32 gigabytes um, that ranged at five, basically $600. And when Mac really broke the market is when we had, when the iPod shuffle came out and it hit that sweet spot. Um, and I did my own, I had my own cow bell kind of uh, drawn out of my house. And I gave each bracket its own category. And this is, uh, this area is where I call, this is my term, this is where I call, um, I don't know if I want to use that term. This is the check to check area. So, um, and, and that's what, and, and, and that's what, um, Max tipping point is when they when they capture the market for folks who who live check to check were able to afford Mac products. That was the sweet spot for them, and those those iPod shuffles like just started running off the shelf for Christmas. I'm going to turn it over to Sylvia, um, and she's going to give us a clear breakdown of the three rules of epidemics um, as the law. I don't, in, in the, I'm sorry, uh, 
the law of the few, the stickiness factor, and the power of context. And of course, Gladwell, like all of the other authors, has his um, three points as well. <laughs> exactly. So in the book, um, Gladwell talks about the law of the few, the power of context, and the stickiness factor. Basically, all of these factors that create epidemics for all these small changes that make one big epidemic. So first we have the law of the few. And the law of the few is basically, or it's essentially about those people who create epidemics. You have your connectors. Those are people who know everybody, like Aaron Muhammad here, who <laughs> know they know everybody in Nashville. <laughs> and so those are the people who know people in government, in education, in restaurant, hospitality. They're able to connect on different levels in different worlds. They have their foot in many different worlds and different doors. Um, we also have the mavens. The mavens are the people who have information. And those people want to share their information just for the sake of sharing it. Anybody that they can talk to, whether it's at the barber shop or in the grocery line at the store, they want to share the information that they know and that they have to help other people. And then we have the salesmen. The salesmen are the persuasive people. So you have your connectors and your mavens, but they might not necessarily persuade people. Your salesmen are the ones that are persuading people on the idea of whatever change, whatever epidemic, whatever it is the information that they feel is important. Okay. Um, next, we have the stickiness factor. And basically, Gladwell talks about you can have all these connectors and these people who know people, but if the information you have isn't sticky, if it isn't attracting people and holding people and grabbing people's information, it's kind of you know useless. What's the point of it? And so one of the examples that he gives is about Sesame Street and how the concept was so sticky. Because when Sesame Street started in the 1970s, and when they were thinking about starting Sesame Street in the 1970s, it was unheard of to mix cartoon characters with real people. And so Aaron's going to play a video for us. Celebrities as permission givers. 
is, is unhealthy, is wrong, but since, you know, um, Jennifer Lopez is eating this pizza on the on TV, everyone is calling Pizza Hut and ordering it, or he celebrates, you know, smoking cigarette, everyone is, all the kids are gonna think it's cool. Or um, he also used these other cases that happened in New York, um, that teenagers started, this company was going under, and then it's a shoes company, teenagers started wearing it, and within one year, the company started um, making millions of dollars, and they started even uh, setting up shops in the Hollywood, and, and that brand became a celebrity brand. So he, he kind of traced all that back to, as a leader, as a change leader, or even in, in the industry organization, once you find out that who are the permission givers in that society, or who are the salespeople, who are the mavens, um, and you focus your resources or whatever you're pushing on those people, then you become successful in starting your own epidemic. So we're just gonna play a, a video of one of the uh, original permission givers and as it relates to the uh, Philip Morris brand. <laughs>
social programs, we were allowing small things to get worse rather than, than killing them from the earliest possible stage. So uh, that, 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 that approach had been tried in other cities, but also small cities. And there was a big debate about whether it could work in a city as large as New York. One of the ways that New York used to resist any kind of change was to say, it can't work here. <laughs> because they wanted to keep the status quo. And this is such a desire for people to do that, to keep the status quo. And I, I thought, well, there's no reason why it can't work in New York City. I mean, it, it, um, we have bigger resources. We may have bigger problems, we have bigger resources. Same theory should work. So we started paying attention to the things that were being ignored, uh, aggressive panhandling, the squeegee operators that would come up to your car and wash the window of your car whether you wanted it or not. Sometimes you know, smash people's cars or tires or windows. Or, uh, the uh, street level drug dealing, the prostitution, the graffiti, all these things that were deteriorating the cities. So we said, well, wait, we got, we're gonna pay attention to that. And it worked. I mean, it worked um, because we not only got a big reduction in that and improving the quality of life, but massive reductions in homicide. And New York City turned from the crime capital of America to the safest large city in the country for five, six years in a row. <clears throat> Another thing about power context is that Gladwell says, I'm going to use my Apple iPhone, where I have my notes on it. He says that um, small things, all uh, small things are the ones that create these um, epidemics. And that it's not, don't look at this big thing that like you have to make this huge movement. But like in the civil rights movement, there were so many events and so many small things happening that created this one big thing. We clearly use social media a lot. So when King comes to Birmingham, he's not coming pursuing some kind of whimsical notion of a great story. He's coming with a heavy heart and with a real sense of desperation, right? He's just failed in Birmingham, in, Al in Albany. Things are falling apart. This is his last stand. And then there's the question of the perfect villain, of the perfect victims, the children. Let's be clear, King did not want to use children. Nobody wanted to use children. The reason was simple. Birmingham was an incredibly dangerous place. It was a place where, it was Birmingham. It was a place where the Ku Klux Klan was running free, where it was standard issue for if any black family was deemed to be so uppity as to move into a white neighborhood, they would simply dynamite their home. Fred Shuttleworth, who was the minister at 16th Street Baptist Church and one of the most prominent uh, uh, activists in the city, had his home blown up when they got there. The Freedom Riders, right, got pulled off, the, got their bus uh, 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 burned on fire. And then when they finally arrived at the bus station, they got beaten up while the cops just sat there and watched. King's own brother had his house blown up. Uh, the, the first meeting that King has when he comes to Birmingham he goes around the room to all of his trusted lieutenants and he gives each person, delivers each person a kind of mock eulogy. And the meaning of what he's saying is clear, is that he didn't expect them all to survive that time in Birmingham. One of the first speeches he gives at 16th Street Baptist Church, this enormous 200 pound Nazi strides down the aisle, walks up on stage and just starts pummeling King in the face with his fists. It's actually one of the most extraordinary moments in King's career, because you know what King does? Is once he realizes what's happened, and the people descend and try to wrestle this man off, King covers his assailant with his body so people can't beat him up. And he whispers to him and says, you know, you're not gonna win this battle. We're gonna win, and I love you. And he lifts the man up and holds his arm up like this for all of the audience, and says, this man is a brother. Right? It's an incredible moment in, in, in the history of the civil rights movement. And there's another quick video on the civil rights movement. Okay. Oh. oh, 26 minutes. Okay, well, that's fine. I'll um, just say that, going along with that, um, Gladwell says in his book, it is the paradox of the epidemic that in order to create one contagious movement, you often have to create many small movements first. And Muhammad's going to conclude. But uh, <laughs> as far as the matches are concerned, we can't light our matches in here. But what those matches uh, simply represent are building blocks, um, 
and the small pieces that it takes to make an epidemic. And what we know is that it only takes us to like one of those matches for it to spread like wildfire. And in conclusion, the whole book, he encourages for you to, to start or to a social epidemic or as a leader, um, you have to have a focus, test, and drive. So concentrate all your resources, all your time on the three which are the connectors, the maven, and the salespeople. We you want your idea to take off. Focus on those and also test your idea and also believe in it. That's what he suggests at the end of the book. So the whole book can be focus, believe, and try. Any questions? Are there any questions? There needs to be some questions. <laughs> How many of you have read the Pacific Wall? Really? I would have thought it would have been a little higher. Okay, on a scale of 1 to 10, with uh, 10 being you must read this book, how do you uh, view the tipping point? Group uh, 3. Um, I would, I mean, it was a really good book. There's a lot of stories in there. I would give it a 9 or a 10. 9. Yeah, I have There's a lot of stories. Yeah, I have it to just, so, I mean, I used to be used to read books on one subject, but he has so many case studies. Mm -hmm. One fascinating case study I want to share with is that um, case study that he was saying that this lady uh, in public health in that sector, for years she has been trying to encourage African-American women to get a breast cancer awareness thing. She had all these resources and grants. She keeps going to churches every Sunday. Never what people go to churches, eat their food, leave. So what she did was she went to beauty shops and she identified the, the women that owned those shops and kind of convinced them. And then she saw a big change. So mm -hmm. he, he gets, he used case studies and ideas from every level. Um, one thing that Linda, sh uh, Linda sh shared with us was the cop story that happened in Europe about the syrup and kids getting sick. He used that um, and how only a few people got sick, but in Europe, it becomes a social epidemic, a lot of people, and then COP really look bad. Um, so he kind of used all kinds of examples, so it's a very fun book to read. I would give it a nine. A nine? I would give it a nine. Um, I, I think I actually enjoyed uh, David and Goliath a little better. Sure. And uh, But I give it a nine just because of the caliber of author that uh, Gladwell is and how he breaks things down. And if you can't tell, he actually has an uh, investigative journalism background uh, because he can dissect anything um, and if you don't have time to read it of course you can buy the audio version but Gladwell um, he has about three TED talks right now and if you listen to enough of his things you'll you'll pull it together well, good job uh, appreciate it uh, remember uh, I think we talked about it last weekend but uh, Gladwell's here next week this coming week I don't know if you're so, planning on going but and that's when we plan on getting our email statement from you oh well, that's good <laughs> <laughs> that's good all right. Our book was Building the Bridges You Walk On It, which was the third in a trilogy, um, following up Change the World by Robert Quinn. So we'd like to take you on an introductory journey to the fundamental state of leadership, as described by Robert Quinn in the book Building the Bridges You Walk On It. Quinn chose to describe the fundamental state of leadership in exactly those words, build the bridges you walk on. And we're gonna go into detail what that means. He did this because when you're in the fundamental state of leadership, which we talked about a little bit in our last class, you're in a place of deep change. So close your eyes and listen to my voice. <laughs> and imagine, deep change. It's uncertain and it's exhilarating at the same time. It's kind of like uh, change that has a personality disorder. It's a place of transformation that leads you to a new place of existence. It's a bridge you're building as you go. So we invite you to come on our journey and experience. Shannon Ashford, <laughs> Catherine Glover, and Kelly McCain are gonna guide you through your journey. Quinn states that success is an organization that is extraordinarily positive, similar to this cohort. He calls these organizations productive communities. Productive communities are built in organizations with three specific objectives. It helps people transform themselves and helps them enter the fundamental state of leadership. 
It provides new language in which to think, turning our ways of thinking about leadership away from behaviors and towards who we are. It supports the leaders developing leadership in new ways, attracting others to the process of deep change. So we begin in the normal state, which is pretty much where many of us are functioning now, unless you've already been up here and given your presentation, <laughs> you may have found yourself. Um, you cease to respond in the normal change to changes, and thus don't progress. You're self-focused, you put your own needs ahead of anything else, you're ego-driven, and we discussed last time that could be good or bad. You're externally directed, you're internally closed, and you're comfort-centered. You live in a reactive state. So in the normal state, you're, everything changes but you. It's business as usual. And, and you live in that reactive state. You're always reacting. And you stay in your comfort zone. However, in the fundamental state of leadership, you leave the normal state behind. And you're making deep change that we mentioned at the very beginning. You're more purpose-centered. And also, as we discussed last time, we had a, a running start with this, so thank you for the opportunity in the last class, because this helped us. You become other-focused. You put the common good ahead of your ego, thereby increasing authenticity. We heard from Patty's group, authenticity. Internally directed, you're closing the gaps of your own hypocrisy, again, um, not good, bad, or indifferent, but it brings you to another state. You're reaching higher levels of security and confidence. You're externally open. You move outside your comfort zone. You seek feedback. You receive higher levels of awareness. You're purpose-centered. You clarify what result you want to create, and you pursue meaningful tasks. You move to levels of personal and collective integrity. Multiple lenses that are not available in the normal state. You're feeling more, you're learning more, you're achieving more. It's just a whole transcendental state that you're not normally in. Or what Kelly's book is soon to be the Nirvana. Leadership, <laughs> leadership Nirvana. When you enter the fundamental state of leadership, you generally choose to enter this state. When you do this, you choose to live from principle that will change your relationships in a very powerful way. You claim your integrity. We hear this in, as a theme throughout this evening. Quinn refers to Thoreau when he states that action from principle comes new organization. We choose to enact our best selves, people, therefore must react to us differently. So we're choosing to courageously enter this transcendent state living by principle, and it does take courage. Many of the groups tonight have focused on role models and leaders and activists and others, and it is not easy. It's extremely risky in many cases, and it certainly takes a high level of courage, tenacity, integrity to be able to survive in this state. Okay. And you'll notice the bridges on here, we've, we've chosen for many reasons, and we've, we've labeled them. They're across the state of Tennessee. Mm -hmm. But uh, you'll find at the end that these are all gonna have something in common. So, a new view of leadership. We've got the new language that we spoke about. We don't think of things in either this way or that way, not to be redundant and reiterative, but we're hearing this throughout the class tonight. We think of things both this way and that way. So you now think of change with a transcending strategy. Through transformational perspective, you merge what we saw again, political perspective of compliance, interpersonal perspective of trust, the technical perspective of logic. We know Laura loves that technical perspective. And you bring all these together to create the transcending strategy. And so he took what you spoke about in Change of the World he took it one step further and, and did an integrative approach of using all of those strategies. But you, you have three lessons that you learned. So, those three <laughs> lessons are you accept your results through the work of others who embrace the vision. You're vulnerable. I don't think anybody in here enjoys being vulnerable, but 
twin states that you need to be. Patience and adversity. If you believe in your vision, even when nobody else does and realizes that not everybody else will, you'll find this new view of leadership. Imagine this. There are eight steps. <laughs> eight pathways to achieving the fundamental state of leadership. We're going to try to make this as painless as possible because there are a lot of them and they're pretty heavy in their own right. Um, each one of these has pretty much their own chapter in the book. So we've culled it down as, as best we can. Reflective action, we find our best selves when we reflect deeply. I don't think there's anyone in here that would argue that fact. Authentic engagement, being more engaged in the world of action with love for what we are doing. And the love comes from increased integrity, thus allowing more authenticity. Appreciative inquiry, asking transformational questions. They give rise to shared vision, leading to self-organizing processes. I know you're all loving these avatars here. Um, and we'll get to this in a little more detail. But in a nutshell, the three of us came together in random order by alphabet. And we are so completely different from one another in so many ways. But the one thing that we found in common to help guide us through this process ourselves was the creation of these bit strips. And we've learned how to focus on one another's leadership skills and so on. And you see them all probably chuckle a little bit on Facebook. But you've got to find connectivity and, and what works and what brings you together. So we created ourselves. And we engage in different levels in social media. Um, grounded vision. Integrating the present with an image of the positive future. Some might call this projecting. Adaptive confidence, and again, each of these are whole chapters in the book. Not to dissuade you from reading it, which I'll try later. <laughs> <laughs> Deep change is scary. You have to be able to be flexible and adapt. You have to have confidence during times of uncertainty. Adaptive confidence means we're willing to enter uncertain situations because we have a higher purpose. Detached interdependence requires that you look at your relationships with maturity. We let go of our need to be in control. Patty, I, I love what you used to say at, at your office because it's so true. This is when you can combine your own independence and strength with humility and openness in your relationships towards others. And I think of that one, that you're not a victim of crimes, and that's the main example I think of that one and it's so easy when people are um, when they are victims of crimes but when you step out of that victim role that's when you're practicing detached interdependence and it's pretty powerful when you do that. It is, it is and responsible freedom is simply being self-disciplined. It's making choices to push yourself to the better going beyond your comfort zone in a responsible way, going beyond your comfort zone in a responsible way. It's not creating chaos and wreaking havoc, although it's, as we've also said all night, it's not an open, easy process. It can get messy and uncomfortable. And then tough love. Many of us do have children and, and we practice tough love often, but when we do, we balance compassion and assertiveness. And that's exactly what Quinn is saying here as well. It's vital for leading others through tough love. We influence and help to develop other leaders by attracting them to the fundamental state of leadership. And we do what's called the two-step. <laughs> Very simplistic. Making the choice to change ourselves helps others to change themselves. Fundamental state of leadership. There are four stages to self-change. Pre-contemplation is we have a problem, but we don't quite see it yet. Others may see it. We can be in denial and resistance. Trying to get yourself or others to embrace self-change when in this stage is very difficult because they just don't see they have a problem yet. Then you're 
reach age two for your contemplation. And that's when you start seeing you, there is a problem with what's going on and you can make some changes. If there's a lot of fear of failure, um, you also are gonna see a lot of procrastination. And that some of the ways to get through this is motivational for your emotions. And that's when you're gonna be journaling, you're gonna be exploring more of the inside of, of what's going on because you, you're finally realizing there is a change you can make. And preparation is when you have an action plan and you're getting ready to do something. You believe you need to make new decisions and you behave in different ways. And then we have the action stage and that's when you start engaging in the new behaviors that you've learned. Um, it's important to reward yourself for others that are going through this process um, and having, it, it, I, I put it akin to the 12 step programs you're going to want to be in other support groups with people that are going through this as well. And um, the 12 step programs follow this a lot. You're, um, you're replacing positive behaviors with negatives. So you're really being engaged in the action plan. And with maintenance, you're you be sure to guard against relapse and be conscious to carry over your new habits in all areas. You build new bridges in new areas and maintain what you have accomplished. And the last stage is termination. This is when you have victory, but you have to be careful because you can relapse into the normal state again. Um, the fundamental state is cyclical. You're not always going to be in it, but you're always going to gain from it. Um, so sometimes you have to go back to the maintenance stage and remember what you've learned. Um, and so just that the termination stage, you do have victory, but you have to be conscious that you can relapse and, and fall into leadership apathy. If you look at these stages and you bring them down into four, many of us have functioned in relationships under strategies that we come together as a group, so we form, right? We storm, we get to know each other, our vulnerabilities, our opportunities, our skills, our strengths. Third stage, norm, normative. We're functioning, we're doing well, we're working together, we get one another. And then fourth stage of performing. So. This is, in a nutshell, what we're thinking that self-change can lead to. So, now, we're about to end our journey. So what did we learn about the fundamental state of leadership? It's a new definition, not as new as the nirvana state of leadership, but it's not a list of skills and traits. It is a sense of being. It's not an authoritative title. It's what we are and what we've become. It's a new definition of leadership development. The? The? Change. Again, <laughs> yes. um, he does, he talks more about it's the change within you, and that's a huge thing in Quinn's books. We have a quote also that was used by Gandhi, which is, we become the change we want to see in the world, mm -hmm. and fully believe that. Quinn believes we're the catalyst for transforming our organizations and all of those around us. Each one of us is a catalyst. Dr. Payton mentioned to us, you know, um, everyone has been in the fundamental state of leadership at one point or another. And it's exhausting to be there, but it's extremely intrinsically rewarding. And it's almost a high that you want to come back to, but you exhaust yourself and you've got to rebuild. And every time you do, it becomes easier to attain that level. And you really never go back. You keep building upon it. So we invite you to come and build the bridge as we walk together. Okay, each one of you has a picture with a quote on it, and we're going to ask you to come up and read your quote and place it on the bridge. As we walk, we all get through this fundamental state by joining this class. So, so we want you to build the bridge with us. Oh, there is somebody else's picture. So, Erica and Kathleen, if you could read yours and then help us to build the bridge. leadership is the capacity to see the best in the world around us, in our colleagues, and in the groups we are trying to lead. It is the capacity to see with an appreciative eye the true and the good and the better and the possible. Look, I swear I place it. And for time, we'll probably have to overlap our, our reading while she's sticking in the next is reading. To make the decision to follow your vision, then, can be very difficult. The end result is this. 
gratification from deep change comes from the work of others who accept, embrace, and move the vision. In fact, it is through the work of others that the true, true, true contribution of a change leader is made. Did these requests that people have sent in to Robert Quinn as they read um, Change the World, and he added them to his book? Mm -hmm. And, and this was a series of correlative stories as well in every single chapter. Patty and Laura and Emily. Oh, well, you got a bigger print for old people. <laughs> <laughs> what lies well, behind us and what lies before us are tiny matters compared to what lies within us. Even when a vision seems to come from the leader, as in the case of Gandhi, the vision moves others because it is deeply in touch with their reality and their hopes. That is why they respond. And the vision is credible because they can see that it is not a castle in the air, but a vision that is grounded in their lived experience, in bread and salt. Humans are inherently free and inherently responsible. They are free to choose, and they are responsible to actualize the potential meaning in their lives. When we take the time to integrate action and recollection, we begin to behave differently as we become more powerful centered in terms of rhythm, others focus, and stand the open, we more fully integrate who we are with what we are with what we are doing at this point. What we are doing enlightens our best self, and our best self enlightens what we are doing. This is how movements work. We never convert everyone. We do not need to go, wait, we do not need to, to move the organization where it needs to go. We need only the critical mass. Yet what is unique about us is what has the greatest potential for bonding us. When we share our uniqueness, we discover the community and greatness that defines everyone. When we change ourselves, we change how people see us and how they respond to us. When we change ourselves, we change the world. This is the legacy of, the, of, the, of people who operate in, in the fundamental state of leadership. When we commit to a vision to do something that has never been done before, there is no way to know how to get there. We simply have to build a bridge as we walk on it. Being humble is often associated with weakness or lack of power. Real humility comes when we see the world as it is, as it really is. The real world is a world of connectedness, of moving flows of power. to make a change. 
we physically just begun to build a bridge as we walk on it. Every time that we meet, every time that we get together, every time that we increase our civic leadership abilities, outreach, awareness, we do indeed build the bridge as we walk on it. All right. For the sake of time, I'll ask one question. There's a lot of information in Quinn's writing all the time, all the steps and eat this and eat that, you know. What's the number one takeaway from your group in terms of uh, this book and in, in the context of leading community change as we are discussing in this class? Number one takeaway. You gotta change yourself first, and people have no choice but to react to you differently. Same group, very well. We agreed, and, and then if we were four, specific points is to become purpose-centered, internally directed, other-focused, and externally open. Even though I did not enjoy this book that much, I am putting those four points into principle with my staff, with my team, sure. and we're gonna study what's behind each of these and how you achieve this. Sure. You know, when uh, we read the Quinn article out of Fundamental State of Leadership uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, I was reminded, yes. after, it dawned on me that we had two books by Quinn too. You want to put the list together of 15 or however many books it was, I didn't, I didn't think that Quinn would be taking, uh, yeah. taking that many times, so but, uh, taking that seriously, <laughs> but, uh, just kidding, just kidding. But uh, it's a, uh, you know, the, the books are a little bit different and his style's a little bit different, but there's some, there's some really good pieces there that, you know, like we talked about, all these things have good pieces to choose from to put together kind of develop our own uh, way of framing and <coughs> seeing, seeing, the, uh, seeing our opportunities to lead and how we can go about doing that. So, great job. Appreciate it. Um, <laughs> can we, can we